Well, good morning and welcome back to the broadcast for Comrade Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN AM for Tuesday, January 14, 2020. Here are our top stories. We'll take a look at CES for 2020. And are you planning a vacation this year? You're going to want to stick around because we're going to talk about planning a vacation. But welcome, everyone. It's Tech Tuesday, and that means a look at the intersection between technology and personal finance and retirement. And who better to talk with us about that but Daniel Klein, Senior Technology and Consumer Products Reporter with The Motley Fool. Hi, Daniel. How are you? I'm good. I'm the blinking yellow light at that intersection. There you are. You are the blinking yellow light. Really great to talk with you. This is obviously a highlight. We, all, we have great segments every week. This is a highlight personally for me. Always enjoy talking about retirement and technology. Dan, you just got back from Las Vegas and the Consumer Electronics Show 2020, 180,000 people attended. What can you tell us in, in what you saw? It's overwhelming and underwhelming all at the same time. So my history with CES goes back to, and I, I don't remember the exact year, but it was either 94 or 95. And back then it was a part of the Las Vegas Convention Center and it was still a major show, but it hadn't grown to what it was. And it was still a time where the big companies came and made announcements. Now, more than 25 years later, we, we are looking at major changes where the big companies skip CES. So Apple, Microsoft, Sony, while they may have a presence on or off the floor, they're saving their big announcements for their own events where they're going to own the day in terms of coverage. So what you have at CES is a lot of second tier, third tier, and let's call them 25th tier companies. Um, and... <laughs> The announcements you get are sort of less exciting. Yes, there's product news. Yes, there's companies that introduce new things. Um, you know, I saw the, the the first 5G laptop from Lenovo, which is wonderful. Except there's no 5G network to hook it up to, so it might as well be the first 11G laptop. But it's coming. Um, it's coming. It's I, coming. I know that's not fair because 5G is coming to a certain extent. Uh, and I saw lots of interesting things. Every, every imaginable take on a phone charger or a lock that unlocks with your fingerprint. There, there were at least 200 companies selling those in some variation. But when I say underwhelming, it's because the days when you walk through and see something that you feel is going to be life-changing, they're kind of gone. And you see a lot of gimmicks. One of the ones, and it's driving me nuts, that you're seeing all over the news. I think I've seen at least 20 different news stories on it. Is Charmin, the toilet paper company, was showing off a robot. And that robot brought you a roll of toilet paper if you're out. So in theory, this is basically a remote control car that's hooked <laughs> up to your phone. And one, it doesn't have arms, so it can't open the bathroom door. So it's gonna just bump into your bathroom door if the door is closed. Two, you have your phone and you can't reach toilet paper. This seems like a very specific need. Um, and the reality is this isn't intended to be a real product. This is something that they're showing you with the idea that it's gonna get media attention and you'll start thinking about Charmin. There's nothing consumer electronics about Charmin. It's, it's just toilet paper. And there was some very cool innovation in call it bathroom technology. We saw every manner of smart toilet, uh, you know, toilets that could tell you if you're dehydrated, if you have diabetes, if you need to work out more, uh, you know, every manner of, of, of cleaning help you could get. So there was all sorts of stuff, showers with, you know, really interesting smart technology for conservation, but also steam and, and saunas and and that stuff kind of gets glossed over in favor of the latest robot. And there were all sorts of robots. There have been all sorts of robots for the past 10 years. And those robots are not going to translate into our homes. Like, yeah, when iRobot shows its latest innovations where it did, that will make it to your house within the next six months or, or a couple of years. But when companies are showing robots that, like, you know, fold your clothes – you're never going to spend the money, or at least in the next decade, that's not going to be practical. So you really see a lot of nonsense. So it seems like CES is kind of watered down. And Dan, I got to tell you, you know, when I was doing a little review pre our conversation, I saw a flying car from Hyundai. Hyundai, excuse me. I saw an inkjet, inkjet makeup. 
Okay, so you can print <laughs> you can print off makeup and put it on, which seems really neat. But again, to your point, I think there's less appetite for things like that, and I, I would support your point that it's about more about marketing. And I think I got to think that this is really just when things kind of get antiquated or they, they get really um, they're they're around for a while, right? I mean, there's just it's just hard to outdo what you what you've done, and people get too big for the britches, like Apple, and they want to do their own thing. Yeah, and, and look, CES has become a show more about incremental products. The important people there are the buyers for websites and electronics chains, and they're looking at, okay, there's an entire room full of Chinese companies selling chargers and accessories. Which are the ones we're going to stock? Is there something truly innovative here? A lot of the companies, if you're selling a fingerprint-based lock, your goal is to make a deal with a bigger company to license it or for somebody to buy you. It's probably not to get on Amazon and be the 500th company that sells these things. So you have to sort of look at the show a little bit differently. It's not about innovation. It's not even so much about the keynotes or who's speaking anymore. It's more of just like a mall that's a few months ahead of where the market is. And as a someone attending the show, it's gotten so big that you can't see the whole show. Even I didn't stay the whole time, but even if I did stay the whole time, so I instead focused on, on one specific area, that the Sands Expo Center, which on its own is a very large convention center, had emerging companies and some of the fitness technology and things that maybe we're a little bit more practical. You know, I, I saw some fitness products like a, a boxing robot. And basically, I've joked about this, but the Peloton of anything. Pick any sport and there is a version of it you can buy where someone will yell at you and tell you how to do it through, through the screen. Uh, and those are things that I think we're going to see be more mainstream. We've talked a lot about health and Apple Watch. And I saw some new technologies that it wouldn't shock me if Apple or Google or somebody else stepped in and bought some of these companies so you could do things like uh, you know testing your blood sugar for diabetics just through your watch without a pinprick uh, and a lot of really innovative things uh, and that's really not where the coverage is coming out of the show. Yeah, I mean, Dan, do you think that you mentioned it's too big for its britches, th those are my words, do you think it kind of breaks up and maybe there's more regional shows? I mean, how do you deliver value to so for people to learn more about cons consum consuming electronics? I don't think there's any complaints from the attendees of the show. I mean, CES ha has spit-off parts. E3, the giant video game show, you, all those video game companies used to be part of CES, and they just got overshadowed, so they created their own show. Uh, and there's lots of shows that are very specific. So like, I think it's this week is the National Retail Federation show, which is a huge show for retail. Retail is obviously adjacent to consumer electronics. So you're going to see... Lots of narrow niche small shows. I prefer, like I go to Money 2020, Shop Talk, Grocery Shop. Those are shows with 5,000 people who are hyper-focused on an industry. And sometimes those can get too wonky, whereas CES is much more about like, you know, it's like going to like your local car show. You're going to see a lot of cool stuff. You're going to get to meet Batman. He's standing next to the Batmobile, but you're not really getting anything truly innovative. And I think most of the innovative stuff is being held by the big companies for their own events. And the smaller companies are taking advantage of that and sort of using it to show. I mean, look, you mentioned the flying car. Yep, Hyundai and Uber showed off a flying car. Will there be flying cars in the next 10 years in any meaningful way? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> so, you know, now I saw a ton of drones. And if you want to tell me the use of drones for inventory and back office operations in non-populated areas is going to explode, I would agree with you. If you tell me that drones are going to deliver burritos in any meaningful way, I'll tell you no, that's not going to happen anytime soon. Well, Dan, all I can you, you let you lost me at Batman, and I'm thinking, is it Adam West? Is it uh, Michael Keaton? Is it George Clooney? <laughs> Or all the above. Val Kilmer, so, right? I mean, they were all so, great actors. So, so I make that joke because it's the annual auto show time in West Palm Beach where I live. So about a mile from my house, the whole waterfront is taken over by, you know, cars, concept cars, people with their cool, I don't know, Camaros. But at every time I've ever been, somebody owns a Batmobile. And no, it's not Adam West, who's sadly no longer with us. Uh, it's not even Val Kilmer, who sadly is still with us. Um, it's, that's a joke, Val Kilmer I know. fan. I understand. We're not going to hold you to that. <laughs> it's some guy who owns a Batman suit that you've paid $400 to stand next to your $150,000 Batmobile. Yeah, no, 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 no. 
Well, Dan, thanks for the assessment of CES. Sounds, sounds like it was all in all a good time. When we come back, we're going to talk to Dan, Dan about planning a vacation. How do you do that online? You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses. I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Welcome back. We're talking to Dan Klein. He is Senior Technology Consumer Products Reporter for The Motley Fool. Dan, it's 2020, and I know you're already planning vacations, aren't you? So I vacation perhaps more than the average person. Because I work from home, I have a lot of flexibility to take a vacation where I still work a partial day. So I've kind of become a master at it. I also live in a place in Southern Florida where you have very easy access to cruise ships. Uh, you have very easy access to the theme parks in Central Florida where we also have a home. And you also get favorable pricing. So I live in a market. And we also have an enormous amount of airports. So my ability to sort of look around, like I just flew to Las Vegas for the Consumer Electronics Show. That was a last minute decision. And in order to make that happen on a cost effective basis, I couldn't fly out of West Palm Beach, an airport I could walk to from my house. I couldn't fly out of Fort Lauderdale, which is about 35 minutes away. I instead had to fly out of Miami which is maybe 90 minutes away, uh, but in exchange for making that ride, I got a flight that was maybe two-thirds cheaper than doing it at my local airports. So that's just one of the little tricks. Most people live within driving distance of more than one airport. So it's very important to sort of be open and look around. And unfortunately, I flew Frontier Airlines, which is a low fare but they charge you for everything airline. So you have to pay for your seat assignment, your bag, if you want a drink, it's $2.99 and that's just for a soda. Um, but by willing to be, being willing to make that compromise, I was able to take a trip that I otherwise probably couldn't have justified. Well, Dan, many of us are familiar with the Priceline Negotiator, right? And <laughs> bookings.com, did you like that? Hopefully we didn't scare the audience off, but hotels.com. There really are a number of web apps and tools online that can help people. So you don't necessarily need to go to that travel agent, although some people may want to do that, right? When you're planning a vacation, you want to start early. And one of the things you want to look at is, are there any loyalty programs? Are, is there anything I could join that might get me slightly better deals? So in the case of the cruise lines, most of their loyalty programs are based on, have you been with us before? Right. The good thing about that is, is that's retroactive. Meaning, like, I, I took my mother on a cruise and I called up the cruise line and I said, how much for an extra room? Uh, this is my status. I'm taking my mother. And they said, well, has she ever been? And I said, yeah, many years ago. They found her number and the fact that she'd been once a decade ago gave her a significantly better price uh, 
to be fair, gave me a significantly better price than it would have been had it just been a blind booking. That's often true with airlines. It can be true with hotels near the theme parks. It can be true of you know almost any place you're gonna go. Uh, so you wanna look at all the options. The other thing you wanna do is you wanna start price comparing. Figure out early on what it should cost and what the variances are. If you're going to fly to Orlando during a school vacation week in February, it is going to cost you probably twice as much than if you can do the same trip in late August when kids in the Northeast are not back in school, but kids in Florida are, and it's somewhat hot and unpleasant here, so less people want to go. So if you have to fly Thanksgiving, that's going to cost you more. Uh, we were going to bring my mother here for Thanksgiving, and I said to her, well, if you want to come in, you have to come in like the Wednesday before and leave the Tuesday after, because even having to put you up in an expensive hotel, it's still cheaper to do it that way. So the more flexibility you have, the better you can do. If you don't have kids in school, well, if you want to take a, a trip and it's during a time kids are in school, chances are trips are going to be cheaper. If you want to go to Las Vegas and you can visit at, when it's not a major convention or March Madness or the Super Bowl, well, you're going to pay a lot less money. I mean, I'm talking CES this week, hotel rooms were for mediocre hotels were $400 a night. If you go next week when nothing is happening, even just simply joining a loyalty program for the casino and you might get 25 to $30 a night rates at acceptable hotels, Planet Hollywood, Harris, New York, New York. These are nice places to stay that you can get very cheaply. So it all comes down to doing your homework and being creative. Are you a warehouse club member? Well, both Costco and Sam's Club not only have travel booking services that can get you deals, but sometimes they have deals on cruises, deals on theme park tickets, deals on on an admissions or bundling your whole vacation together. So if you know what it should cost, then you can sort of figure out how you can save money. And then Dan, let's not forget budget. That's important. Know how much you want to spend both in accommodations and also trap, you know, uh, accommodations and airfare and also what you want to spend on the ground. That I think is a good place to start as well. Maybe after you figure out where and when you want to go. Yeah. And it's important to figure out what makes you happy. So, you know, before we lived here, we would, a couple of years, three years before we lived here, each year we took a trip to the theme parks. And we realized it was not important to us to stay on Disney property. It was more important for us to have space. So we rented two, three bedroom condos off of property. We also decided it wasn't worth it to eat dinner at Disney. We weren't going to spend 14 hour days there. So most days we'd have a pick me up lunch at the parks finish whenever we finish, six o'clock, eight o'clock, and then eat a much less expensive meal off property in a, you know, a chain restaurant that costs you $20, $25 a person, as opposed to a $50 to $100 dinner. I mean, not that you can't eat cheaper, but we made those choices because they didn't impact us. I'm surprised at how often I go on a cruise, and I go on a cruise pretty much every month, and you see people that have done no homework, and they go to the bar and order a drink, and they're shocked when they get charged for the drink. And they say, well, he didn't get charged for the drink. And they say, yeah, he bought a drink package before he got on board. There's always extras. Even if you go to an all-inclusive resort, well, find out maybe you love top shelf scotch and maybe top shelf scotch isn't included. And every time you get one, it's gonna cost you an added $6. That's fine if you've budgeted for it. It's not so fine if you get on your cruise or you land at your, your destination and you realize that there's a lot of things you have to spend money for and you don't have that money. Yeah, well, really good advice. And you know, now's the time to plan. It's January, now's the time to plan if you're gonna take a trip with the family in the summer. Dan, always appreciate your insight. Great to learn more about CES and what the impact could be to us as consumers. And of course, everyone planning a trip really appreciates your input as well. Great talking to you. We'll talk to you later on in the week for the podcast. I look forward to it. And that wraps up this episode of BRNAM. Hey, have a financial topic or someone of interest that you think we should interview? Drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the news in retirement, markets, technology, personal finance, so much more, check out today's edition of The Morning Pulse. So until tomorrow, I'm Jeff Snyder. Keep on saving and don't forget, roll with the changes. Say